All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's SimScale webinar on predicting wind loads with CFD. Um, let's first get a few technical things out of the way. Um, I see already in the attendee list um, a lot of people joining, so thanks a lot and welcome. Um, and it would be great if you could quickly indicate um, whether or not the um, audio is working by raising your hand. There's a little button that allows you to raise your hand within uh, GoToWebinar. And ah, yeah, all right. <laughs> I can see the first hands going up. So it seems like the audio is working. Um, and um, then a few other remarks. There is the option to ask um, questions um, within this GoToMeeting or GoToWebinar software. So you can simply type them in um, during, the, during the webinar as we go. Um, and afterwards, if we have time, um, I'll try to answer them. If not, um, you can see my email address, my contact information within the slides and also within the webinar information. So feel free to reach out to me afterwards um, and I'm happy to take it then on a one-to-one -one setting with you. All right, um, a quick introduction of myself. My name is David. Um, I'm the managing director here at SimScale. My background is in um, applied math, um, numerical analysis, and I work mostly in um, applications of fluid flow. And this is why I'm going to talk today about um, how to use CFD to predict wind loads and more specifically how to do it with SimScale. But before we do so, um, I quickly want to make a step back with you and actually ask the question of why we should care about CFD or flow simulation in the first place. Because it's um, all of you guys now carved out 20 to 30 minutes, depending on how fast I am. I'll try to, I'll try to stick to the timeline, I promise. Um, all of you guys decided today to carve out uh, 30 minutes out of your busy schedule to, um, to learn about this, right? And so I think it's, it's fair to say that we first should talk about why should we care? Why, why, why are these 20 minutes well-invested time? And I want to start with a bit of my perspective because I'm a, I'm a mechanical engineer by training. So I am, I'm working a lot um, with our customers in the architecture and civil engineering space. But by, by training, I'm a, I'm a mechanical engineer. And so it was fascinating for me to learn um, how a building design process, a building design project is actually executed. And um, I found this very, very nice um, graphic that from my perspective illustrates very well the complexity of a building design process. Um, and that starts with many different disciplines necessary um, to, to contribute to such a project's success, right, that need to work hand in hand. Plus, so all of this is sort of exponentialized by the fact that there's many different phases through which a building project goes until it's finally handed over to the customer, right? And this together creates a very, very complex structure, a very complex um, sort of setting in which a very, very complex um, technical design needs to be delivered, right? On time, on budget, within constraints given by the customer. And in addition to that, um, such, a, such a design project um, is not only very, very, um, the stakes are very high because it's typically a multi-million dollar project, but also the uncertainty is very high, right? Because compared to the mechanical design sector, so if, if in a mechanical design is oftentimes manufactured very, very often, right? Um, so one design is produced multiple times, but in the building space, in the architecture space, each building, while certainly there's similarities between building projects, each building is ultimately very um, unique, right? Um, a unique landscape, maybe a unique constraints, unique constraints by the customer, et cetera. So, and so all of this adds to the, to, to the very challenging nature of getting a building design on budget, on time, out the door of an architecture firm. And so this is where, um, where I want to talk about simulation because in that very, very challenging environment, everything that helps us to reduce uncertainty, to make more informed decisions early in the process is a welcomed help. And this is ultimately what simulation in general and today more specifically flow simulation, um, specifically talking about wind loads is about, right? It's a tool that helps us to navigate through this process better. Um, and to, to make this a bit more crisp, let's take a look at this little chart here. On the left, you can see um, project costs. So basically, how much money will it take to get a building design out the door, to get a building design ultimately commissioned? Um, and these, at the, at the lower axis here, you can see the, the different phases through which, uh, um, the early phases of a building project. And so interestingly, if you now think about it in a very, very conceptual way of how now the project cost is defined, so 
how costly, how much money will a building ultimately cost until it's out the door um, or until the project is over, the definition of that cost happens very, very early. So the, the, the biggest amount of cost definition happens in a very early phase of the design process, right? Because in that process, you'll make the really big decisions. Um, and we're going to talk about them later a bit. So the big fundamental decisions about how this building look like, how it's going to be placed, what fundamental um, sort of architectural has, et cetera, are, are decided here. And then over time, as the building design evolves, only like smaller decisions are made. I'm not saying that none of these decisions matter, but their impact on the overall cost of the building are tremendously, high, uh, tremendously lower than they are in early design phases. And interestingly enough, in a very asymmetric manner, the realization of the costs um, is very yeah, different to that because the early phases of, of a building design project are, are cheap, right? Not a lot of people working on it, not a lot of commit um, done on, on any assets of the building, um, and a lot of things are still floating. And so the, the early phases are very cheap to handle, and at the same time, they, they define most of the cost. And so that's in, in, in that space or, or given these um, constraints, now simulation is a tool that basically helps us to make better design decisions early in the process. So everything that simulation ultimately does is allowing us to make decisions earlier, which means, and I'm not saying that only in the con conceptual phase or in the, or the schematic design phase, but in a more general way, simulation allows us to make these decisions earlier because it fundamentally enables us to predict the physical behavior of um, our building, of, of the surrounding of our building, um, virtually, right? We can explore more design versions, more design variants um, in a faster amount of time in parallel, and we can get a feedback of how this building will perform in the real world just based on, you know, based on our computers. And um, I put this little asterisk at, at better because that's a very vague way of putting it, right? Um, and to make this a bit more crisp, um, I just added a, a, little more, um, a little more detail here. So better can mean many different things in different projects and different phases of a project. It can mean that ultimately you need to keep stay in budget, right? Um, it can mean that you have certain uh, sustainability um, constraints by your customer that you need to meet and you, you, better, you better get there, right? Um, it can mean that, your, um, that the deadline is tight and you, you want to avoid design changes later or, or getting feedback from the construction site that you need to change stuff. Um, and then ultimately, there's always a lot of risk um, involved in, in then ultimately commissioning a, a building. And this reducing this risk um, is something a lot of stakeholders in the building design process are interested in. And so these earlier design decisions help us to do all of that, right? And different stakeholders, and now that's the next thing, might be interested in different benefits of, of these early decisions. So the architect um, oftentimes cares most about, um, so he's not necessarily interested in, we're going to talk about wind loads later, necessarily interested in um, the stiffness of the building, right? As long as it's stiff enough, let's put it that way. But what he is interested in is um, keeping deadlines. And so if he submits multiple designs of a building that, um, that will be challenging, you know, for the structural engineer to handle, um, that's going to be costly changes down the road, right? So he's interested in actually making sure that um, he gets it right the first time or maybe the second time. And then again, a lot of architectural firms nowadays try to, um, you know, set themselves apart by by providing higher or building that simply show a higher performance than others do. And higher performance can mean um, lower energy consumption. Um, it can mean um, passive design, that sort of stuff. So they are interested in, in building performance um, while certainly different than, than a civil engineer is with the, what the, the next step is here. So the engineer might be interested in um, when he when he basically certifies the building or when he when he allows the building to move the building design move to the next phase he's interested in having high confidence in his decision right because ultimately it'll be his job is on the line if there's if there's bad decisions being made and we're going to explore today a little bit um on, on one specific use case um how that how that is in um or how what this means with a with a real uh, with a real world project um that being said, <laughs> all of this is obviously biased by a, by a, said by somebody that, that makes a living from, from selling simulation software, but we've seen very often um, that 
this making design decisions earlier um, helps customers to be more competitive in there, right? Because ultimately all of this comes down to improving the bottom line of, of the guy or um, that, that is using simulation. That's what it all comes down to. So this is basically as a wrap up, this is why we should care about flow simulation in general or why simulation, flow simulation can be a tool that sets you apart from your competition. Um, and so in the next step, let's talk about why now, why should I care about SimScale? So there's a lot of CUD tools around, there's a lot of simulation tools around, so why is there now another one with SimScale? Um, so the idea behind SimScale is the, the people here are frustrated or have been frustrated by the fact that simulation has been reserved to, or flow simulation also in specific, has been reserved to specialists and large corporations because it takes a ton of hardware, a ton of computing hardware to support modern flow simulation tools, to actually being able to use them in a productive manner. So that's the hardware part. Um, the second part is the prices of software and that hardware are tremendous, right? So the, the, the amount of money people need to put on the table to run the first flow simulation in whatever project they want to use it is significant. Um, and last but not least, and it might be a consequence of the first two, last but not least, it's been built for specialists to use, right? People that have access to simulation software most of the time use it all day long because the it's expensive tools, it requires a lot of hardware, and so people are interested, is, are not interested in, in using it, you know, um, every, like once every two weeks or something and, and then support such a very expensive workplace, so that's not what they want to do. And so these are the three things um, we fundamentally try to change with SimScale. Um, to, to put it in, in a more crisp way, First, we want to make it accessible. So it's a web application. Um, I know that some of the audience already know SimScale, but some of them have never seen it. So it's accessible, which means um, it runs in a standard web browser. You don't have to care about hardware. Um, we wanted it from the very beginning to be very cost efficient so that it supports or that it's able to be deployed in projects and companies where before it was economically not feasible to, to, to invest in simulation software which means that there is a free tier that you can start with for learning and public use and professional plans start um, 2,000 euros or 2,400 dollars a year um, and you're, you're, you're good to go. And last but not least, this, this know-how piece um, we're tackling with a, with a large community that is being built on top of this, um, of this cloud platform. So there's tens of thousands of um, engineering professionals using SimScale today and there's, um, they collaborate in, in this public community. We have a, um, just, just last week we deployed a new update that gives every customer of SimScale, every professional subscriber access, direct access to our support team via live chat. Um, there's a lot of training material around, etc. So we're trying to make simulation ultimately accessible to everyone, um, and that's what it, what, what's unique about SimScale. We're going to see it later a bit in action, so uh, bear with me for a couple of more minutes, and then we'll actually see. All right. Um, then let's talk about what it actually can do for, specifically for the architecture world. Um, you know what? Let's first take a look at how it actually looks like to get a feeling for the UI. Um, this is a little, um, a little, um, basically a wind comfort analysis. So this is a little urban area um, being uploaded as a simple STL file, and this is a Google Chrome, a standard web browser. So you just bring in your model. You, you, we support generic CAD exchange formats out of the mechanical and the architecture world. Um, we're working on supporting also native formats, but nowadays um, the general exchange formats um, are supported. For the architecture world, we learned that STL is, a, is oftentimes a good fit for the tool stack they're using, but we also support STEP and, and IGES. And then um, basically once you brought in your model, the next thing you'll do is you'll set up a simulation, meaning in that scenario um, I'm interested in, in how um, in the pedestrian comfort within this urban area and how this large building affects it. And so um, here I would say the wind is coming out of this direction and um, it's blowing with that speed. And then afterwards I run it in the cloud. All heavy lifting is done in the cloud so my local hardware is not being used. I get the results back. I can do visualization both online, um, but I'm, we're also compatible with offline systems that you can use for visualizing and analyzing post-processing the data further. But the important note here is that all of this happens in your web browser, right? Nothing to be deployed locally, no hardware to invest, no software to install, everything online. Um, 
which, make, which makes it much more convenient to the end user. Let's talk about more specifically what the AEC um, space, uh, how the AEC space can benefit from SimScale, what type of analysis are supported here, and what we're seeing mainly being done on SimScale is, on the one hand side, wind load predictions. We're going to see a specific use case later in more detail, but then also um, pedestrian comfort, so entire urban areas where people are not so concerned about um, the structural effects of these forces that are um, that are being generated but more on wind speeds peak loads venturi effects uh, etc and we have other we have other webinars on that as well if you're interested in that um, also internally so it's a general purpose cfd tool so it's possible to do um, internal flow simulations such as in that case um, a ventilation strategy for um, for a large occupant space is being analyzed um, and here, people are mainly concerned about sustainability, energy consumption, um, these sort of things. And last but not least, also more exotic ones such as um, mass transport, um, contamination control. Here we can see a smoke extraction system being analyzed in a parking lot. And so there's many different ways how building designs or parts of a building are being affected by um, aerodynamics, by hydrodynamics. Um, and since, it, since SIMSC is a general purpose simulation tool, um, it gives you the tools to run these analyses. More generally, just as a side note, um, because today the audience is mainly civil engineers and architects, SIMSC is beyond the AEC space. It's a general simulation tool, right? So it does not only support CFD, but there's also functionality available for structural analysis and also um, thermal analysis and a couple of more um, exotic phenomena that, that, that can be analyzed with SimScale, and all of that within one UI. Um, all right, the last note I wanted to, to mention about SimScale is that on top of this cloud tool, right, on this web-based tool where, that you can access, is this community that, that has been or that is evolving around it. So this free tier generates a lot of public simulation projects um, that help others to get started with, with simulation, to be faster with simulation. So there's meanwhile north of 40,000 um, public projects that every SimScale user, either paid or, or, um, or free, has access to and that can be used to, um, to simply get your simulation projects done faster and it's growing rapidly and um, yeah nice things happening in the community all right um, we're almost half of the time so let's speed a bit up and get a bit more concrete about one specific scenario today um, to manage expectations <laughs> this webinar is not so it's not about the fundamentals of CFD it's not about the fundamentals of how to use sim skill it's really about how can CFD help designers and architects um, to become more competitive, to become better at what they do, to um, to make design decisions earlier, right? And I wanted to give a real walkthrough of um, how this can be achieved, but learning how to run such a simulation or the fundamentals of flow simulations, etc., there's other training materials available. So today we really are talking about um, the, the sort of the... Um, the bottom line or the outcome of such a project, but not how to set up such a project. And what we're specifically going to talk about is um, one public project. That project is also available um, on the public uh, project library, so you can take a look yourself later on. Um, it's been it, it will be included in an email afterwards. And we're talking about one specific design scenario in the very early phase of a building design. So we're talking about an overall building shape and um, design criteria or design considerations that are important here. And um, this is basically, um, so wind loads are important in, and we're seeing them being analyzed on SimScale in very different environments or in very different projects. That might start with um, antenna design, so very specific structures, antenna, a very high rise structure, very thin, um, specifically also umbrella antennas, um, are, are being analyzed. There's other sorts of these very special structures, but then also here, um, a bit more of a generic um, example, this is a um, sort of a high-rise structure that could be a building or, or some industrial structure. Um, and um, But then also in coastal regions or regions of very high, where very high um, wind velocities occur, even normal buildings are being analyzed. Um, with respect to wind loads, because wind loads become an important design criteria in these um, in these scenarios. 
And so what we are going to do is we're going to look at a very specific wind load today, which is um, a transient wind load, right? And this is a particularly interesting scenario because CFD here is a such a like gives us such an edge compared to more traditional design methods or methods to predict wind loads and buildings um, that it's I think a very very a good example to see the benefits of CFD. And so without diving too much into the theory of um, of fluid dynamics, here's a little a little sketch of let me bring up these marking tools. I think there's a way how I can show you um, the markup. No, I can't find it. So anyways, let's let's do it without the marker. So you can see the little orange cube on the left, right? Let's assume this is the building from a top view, or this is the building structure, um, and the, the wind is coming from the left. And what's then happening is that the, um, the flow field that evolves around the building starts showing such a flow pattern, right? So vortices are being generated at the edges of the building, at the, at the trailing edges, and they start oscillating. So these vortices become bigger, and they start oscillating. And due to these oscillating motions of these vortices, the pressure field of the, on the left and on the right of the buildings on both sides also oscillates. And out of this oscillation, um, a fluctuating force basically is being generated on the building, which starts basically shaking the building, if you will, right? And this is a particularly interesting, um, it's a transient wind load, right? And this is something a lot of building codes and a lot of... Um, that is not accessible in in um, in a very easy manner because it's a transient effect um, that's that's very hard to put in you know tables or in codes and so um, to to understand this why this particularly interesting is that let's have a look at this chart so we can see at the lower end the wind velocity right um, going going up and um, to the top the crosswind um, force, so this, this fluctuating force. And so if we just look at static wind loads, um, it's sort of there's this continuous ramp up, right? Um, but due to the fact that now this vortex shedding can become um, a dominant force in the force that's acting on the, this building, there might be this specific peak at a specific velocity where where the, the force that is being generated um, is very high, right? And depending now on where this building structure is, um, and depending on for which wind load you're designing, this transient wind load be can become very dangerous, right? And the due to the nature of this phenomenon, it's very hard to assess with standard, you know, paper, pencil, kind of, or building codes. Um, this is a, um, a great example for where CFD, so actually accurately computing wind loads can um, be very valuable in the building design project uh, process. And so here we go, um, we, we take a look at the little um, demo project, and for this, and again, this is publicly accessible, it's just a, um, yeah, a, a simple conceptual um, building shape that is being designed that way. And so it's a 20, centimeter, uh, 20 meters um, wide and 10, 10 meters deep, and then 150 meters high. And um, this now is being simulated at 45 meters per second wind speed. And so let's take a look on SimScale. We're going to see later a quick walkthrough how this looks on SimScale. But let's take a look directly at the results. So this analysis is being done. And here we can see um, one snapshot of the results. So this is the pressure field that we see in the background. So a visualization of the pressure around the building at 50 meters height. So velocity, uh, wind is coming from the left. And I mean, that's what we would expect, right? So we get a high pressure field in front of the building, nothing, nothing fancy there. And then behind, we can already sort of anticipate these vortices that are being shaped here, right? Um, and now if we animate this, we ran this analysis two minutes in real time. So two minutes of real time wind is being analyzed here. And so we can see at the lower, at the top end, the oscillating motion of the velocity field, right? We're seeing high velocities on the left and the right. That's clear, right? That we would expect that. But what's not um, sort of intuitively clear is what's happening at this wind speed that these, um, these vortices are being shaped, right? It's not accessible to our intuition. And also at the lower end, we see um, a cut section from the side and this downwards of the velocity field. Okay, so that, and now we're going to see later that SimScale now allows us to quantify exactly the kilonewtons that are oscillating around this building, right? And now 
to make this actionable as an architect or even as a civil engineer, depending on the on the architectural firm, how it is organized, in which phase in which phase it is, I can now basically accurate accurately predict within a few hours of my time. I mean, even the setup of this was was straightforward, but the computation is a, is a couple of hours. Um, with a little bit little amount of time, I can accurately predict the wind loads here, and I can now mitigate them. Right? I can now make design decisions accordingly. So. Let's let's say okay. I want to actually um, improve the design here, and then there's a lot of literature and a lot of um, yeah literature that that is out there that you can now use to sort of um, conceptually mitigate wind loads, right? Um, there's tapering. You can um, introduce openings, porosity in your building. Um, there's even like I've, I've seen. Uh, I learned that even people use veins and guiding veins on, on outside the building that is being used and then cross-section changes. And last but not least, what we're going to take a look at today is um, softening these corners, right? And again, there's different methods how to soften it and there's a lot of buildings out there that you can see that. But today, I, I just want to give you the, the, the look and feel of the conceptually working with CFD in, 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 in the building design project process. And so we're going to use this last version and going to analyze it against it. So here you can see same story, right? Same building. The only thing that was done is a radius of 1.5 meters was introduced. And so this was the case we've seen, right? Um, we've seen the, the oscillating um, motion of the wind around the vortices being generated. And now this is with the rounded corners or the soft net corners, right? You can, if you look at it very, very closely, you can see the rounded corners. Um, and if you now compare that, it might not be the most obvious visualization. We're going to see it clearer in a second. But you can already see now that specifically if you look a bit more downstream, that the vortices, the amplitude, so the, um, the frequency seems to be pretty much the same, but the amplitude seems to be significantly reduced. Um, Let's zoom in a bit here, um, and again, this is on the left, we can see the sharp corners. On the right, we can see the rounded corners. And now there is this length, length scale in here, right, showing meters. And now we can really see that um, this is the same time snapshot, right, comparing the same vortice, vortex, vortices with each other. And we can see that the amplitude of the, um, of the vortex being generated is significantly smaller with the, with the softened corners, right? And we can even quantify that, right? That's what we want, right? We want to mitigate the, the wind force instead of designing for it. And so quantifying this, and here's now the, a time plot of the resulting fluctuating pr um, force on the building. Um, on pressure force in crosswind direction, um, both for the sharp and for the rounded corners case. And for the sharp corner, you can see that in these very um, these specific times, there is a very very strong force. Right, the amplitude is very high that is that is um, that is acting on this building, while the rounded corners, the peak load is significantly smaller. Right. And so now different stakeholders, again, have different views on this, right? But the structural engineer obviously would prefer to design for the blue scenario as for the, for the red scenario, right? Um, and again, we would need to talk about um, different wind speeds, different um, uh, wind conditions throughout the year, et cetera. So there's more complexity to it. But the, the important factor here is just with a few hours of engineering time in the very early phases of a design um, process of a building, I can get already very, very um, sophisticated information of how this building will perform in the real world and can use it to my advantage, right, for whatever, um, for whatever uh, yeah, advantage I'm, I'm, I'm aiming at. Um, and so just, I'm significantly running out of time, so I'll keep this short, but I wanted to show you once um, how this looks on SimScale. And so for that, um, just for the ones that haven't seen SimScale yet, and afterwards we'll continue with the two minutes of slides and then we're done, I promise. <laughs> just for the ones that haven't seen it yet, SimScale is completely in your web browser. So you go to simscale.com, there's a little button um, where you can log in. My colleague Pavel uh, was logged in here. Um, and so I log in with my credentials and without explaining everything here in SimScale, I directly open up this project in which um, this vortex structure was, or this, this building design was analyzed. And here you can see 3D, um, 3D graphics in your browser. And here I can see the, the building that is um, with the sharp corners 
Um, and then let's quickly take a look at the rounded corner version, right there you go. And then both of these guys are analyzed. Um, let's take a quick look at this as well, just, just to show you that, um, to give you a feeling for the fact that there's basically um, a virtual wind tunnel is being generated around the building. Here's the building, right? And without explaining in detail how this now would work, um, you would basically say here at the on the left, flow is coming in, on the right, flow is going out, um, define boundary conditions, and then you run this analysis in the cloud. Um, it's computationally intensive, but you don't care because it runs in the cloud. And then afterwards, I'm getting back um, I'm getting back the results and I can then decide either I do um, post-process them online using the online post-processor or I can download the results and um, post-process them locally. And so this is how it looks like. Um, let me quickly change the visualization here to get a better feeling. So this is the building, right? So this is a 3D structure and we're looking at a cut section of the velocity field around this high-rise structure. And if I'm now basically pressing on play, what start, what, what I'm basically seeing now is that different time steps throughout the analysis, right? So now we're at second 30, and I can see that so far, actually, the result looks rather steady state, right? And now it appears because of the transient nature of, these, um, of this phenomenon. Vortices are being formed. Around this, um, around this structure and start evolving around it, right? And I wouldn't see this in a steady state analysis. So if I only would look at static wind forces, I wouldn't see this, right? Um, and now I can see, now we're at second 90, so I can see that inherently that that's a transient or, or a, dynamic, um, a dynamic effect. Okay, one quick look that you can actually, because colorful pictures are great, right, but what I'm actually interested in is the um, force plot, right, and let's take a quick look at this as well, so I can quantify them, and there's a lot of different pressures and moments that are being generated, but what I'm interested in is this is the pressure moment around the um, in the x-axis, right, and here you can see already, oh, that's, that's, um, that's oscillating quite a bit, that's the sharp corner case, and then in comparison, the softened corner case, I have a much more hetero, uh, homogeneous, um, not, not, not that much oscillating um, pressure moment. All right, um, that being said, let's jump back to the slides. There's just two or three more slides and I'm almost in time. <laughs> um, the, 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 we just use this as an example because not everybody designs high-res structures, right? Not all of our customers are designing high-res structures. And not all the time um, it's feasible or even necessary to, to take into account transient wind loads on buildings, right? Sometimes that's simply not the, um, the decisive factor that matters in making a, design, uh, uh, a building design project a success or not. But there's many different um, situations and different aspects in, um, in when wind loads matter. So, for example, um, what we what we oftentimes see is it's not just that this transient wind load that matters, but also how, how building orientation impacts um, the wind load, right? Um, we've seen that. There's interaction with the surrounding, different buildings interacting with each other, and then later on, um, wind loads, more detailed wind load computation to get um, facade design right, right? Um, which is not necessarily the first thing that's being taken into account but rather later in the process and then even down downstream in the process when it's really about a detailed analysis of the um, of the structural integrity of the building and stiffness of the building um, there's CFD provides a way how to to in a very detailed way getting um, getting the wind loads that act on a building for the structural engineers to use as an input, right? And there's other methods such as um, codes, norms, etc. But CFD provides, yeah, a very sophisticated way of getting them in a much more accurate way. And so, long story short, wind loads um, play a role in different phases of the design process in different projects. They matter, and CFD, um, specifically with SimScale, allows you to um, to predict them in a very accurate and fast way. One word on accuracy, because oftentimes that's a question that's being asked. Um, there is also in our validation project library also projects that are specifically meant for the civil engineer or for, for such a case. And so, for example, um, this is one of the 
one of the example projects that was analyzed with SimScale just to validate that the results are accurate. And so this is, an, an, um, this is a project that's being published um, on the internet, so everybody has access to that, um, and it's published reference data, so it's an experimental wind tunnel test that was done on such a very small building-like structure, right? And there's the atmospheric boundary layer of the wind being described here that comes in. And um, then within a wind tunnel, different measurement points were taken to measure the velocity in x direction, right? So the wind direction, in, in, in wind direction. And um, so this was a project that was being um, run on SimScale to validate it. And um, so here we can see that at different points downstream of this building-like structure, the, the velocity um, profile was basically measured and then computed with SimScale. And so here we can see with growing Z direction, so basically going from um, the building on top um, to the top, so in that direction, um, Blue was the experimental data, red was being computed with SimScale, same further downstream. So at that point, right at the edge of the building, and then behind the building, starting um, starting at the bottom, and then going up. So that's, um, that's basically just one way of sort of making sure that it's not just colorful pictures um, that, that are being produced, but actually um, quantitative information the engineer or the architect can rely on um, when making design decisions. Wrap up. Why CFD? Um, make design decisions earlier, right? Get be, be more confident to make um, better design decisions earlier. That's what it comes down to. Um, with SimScale, we talked about it, right? It, it's a different way how to do CFD. CFD used to be only meant for specialists and large corporations that have the necessary hardware, software, et cetera, to support all of this. But with SimScale, it gets accessible to a much wider audience. Um, and so, specifically in the AEC sector, with its many different roles, while not while not certainly not, the architect will never run or might not run the um, the detailed structural analysis of a building, and the other way around, right? Um, there's different interests, different motivations with different roles in the in the building design process. But with SimScale, it's the tool becomes so accessible that for different phases, for different design projects. Um, the, the requirements of the person using it have been lowered so much that everybody has a fast access to it. So um, many different roles um, will benefit from it. How to start? If that raised your interest, if you're um, if you're saying I want to get involved in that, I want to give that a spin. Um, you've seen it. You go to simskill.com. You create an account, and that's basically all you need to do to explore that yourself. Um, there is many many um, public projects. The projects I highlighted with the train engine wind load, with the vortex shedding, is also publicly available, um, and everybody can access it. You can just make a copy of this project, explore it yourself. That being said, um, thanks a lot for um, for spending time today in this webinar. Um, I really encourage you to give it a spin yourself. Don't take my word for it. Um, see for yourself it's a if it's a valuable tool for you. And um, with that, I went five minutes over time, so I'm sorry about that, <laughs> but um, I hope it was interesting. All right. Um, with that, I'm going to wrap up the meeting. Thanks a lot for your time, and have a good one. Take care.